Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this, uh, this very special event at the heart of the University of Edinburgh's uh, Alumni Weekend. Uh, I'm Charlie Jeffrey, one of the vice principals of the university, and I'm delighted to welcome so many uh, alumni uh, to this hall they uh, are likely to have seen uh, when they graduated. Uh, I'm delighted, too, to welcome so many others from the city of Edinburgh uh, and uh, beyond. You are uh, very welcome uh, at the university. Uh, and welcome to this event on the Union. Uh, is it better together, or should Scotland say yes uh, to independence? Uh, the event is in two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, a lecture by uh, Professor Tom Devine, uh, the most outstanding historian uh, of modern and contemporary Scotland, senior research professor in our School of History, Classics and Archaeology, and formerly the Sir William Fraser Chair of Scottish History and Paleography. Uh, the title is In Bed with an Elephant, Why Has the Union Survived for Over Three Centuries? After Tom has uh, presented, uh, we will move to a panel discussion, and as you can see, we have a very distinguished uh, panel who I will introduce uh, properly uh, after uh, Tom's lecture. Uh, in order to make that discussion as productive as, pos as possible, we want you to give them questions uh, to answer. Uh, so I will be calling on you at that point. So do have a think about uh, the things that uh, are really burning questions for you uh, as Scotland uh, considers its future in the run-up to the referendum next year. Uh, but let us start off by uh, welcoming uh, Tom Devine to tell us about being in bed with an elephant. Well, uh, th thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for that uh, very warm, warm welcome. Um, really, the reason why I decided to speak on this subject is really to turn uh, one of the conventional aspects of this ongoing debate, which will, of course, run through until autumn next year on its head. Uh, there's been so many um, contributions, both oral and written, about um, would the, the Anglo-Scottish Union come to an end or, or would it not? Um, and precious little about the, one of the most uh, intriguing historical aspects of the Union, why it's lost, lasted for over 300 years. So that's, in a sense, the basic intellectual uh, challenge that faces me this afternoon. Uh, but the second reason is to try and contextualize uh, the debate which, go which is going to follow, which will be about the, the future of the two countries in this existing, in the, in this existing uh, union. Uh, and what I'll do, but very briefly do, in the final uh, stage of the presentation, is try and, and link the question that I'm posing about survival, longevity, and continuity uh, to, the, if you like, the bridge, a kind of bridge which starts to be built in the 60s and 70s uh, when the Union starts to become uh, more unstable than it had been at least since the middle decades of the 18th century. The 300-year-plus experience of union between England and Scotland it was neither inevitable or predictable. It's actually quite common for two, certainly common in Europe, uh, for two ancient states, ancient nations, in this case England and Scotland, but it's quite common in the European continent and elsewhere for unions to disintegrate because of particular historical circumstances. Uh, Norway, Denmark, uh, Spain, Portugal, the Republic of Ireland and Great Britain, and perhaps the most extraordinary and far-reaching and historical process of disintegration, uh, the Soviet Empire, all embedded within a similar landmass in the last quartile of the, of the 20th century. Uh, moreover, if you look carefully at the Anglo-Scottish relationship in the late 17th century, before the Union, and into the, middle the early decades to the middle decades of the 18th century, the future of that association seemed problematic. For example, in a sense you could argue that the high point, the apotheosis 
of the long struggle, the long period of arms struggle between England and Scotland only came to an end in the 1650s, a generation or so before the Union of 1707. And its apotheosis was the occupation, the military occupation of this country by Cromwellian forces between 1652 and 1660. So within the memory of many Scots, and particularly those who, who voted in the Parliament uh, for the Union Act, it was an association reaching back to the medieval period that these two countries had had many generations and in the medieval period many centuries of strife and contestation for territory within, the, within, within uh, Great Britain. Uh, moreover, insofar as we can gauge the attitude of the populace outside the parliament, and remember the extraordinary fact that until 1832, the Great Reform Act, only 0.2% of the population of this country had the vote. The population of Dublin had many more and a much greater electorate than the whole of the population of the nation of Scotland throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries. Insofar as we can gauge the position outside, there was much an indifference in 1706-7, but there was also much hostility, especially in certain parts of Scotia, in particularly the southwest Scotland and in the, some of the, the larger towns, and not least in what was going to become the great area of Jacobite strength in the northeast and in parts of the Gaeltacht, parts of the, of the Highlands. In addition, Scotland was entering into, if you like, a marital relationship with the elephant. Because um, in 1706-7, although the first private census, Webster census, is not until the 1740s, early 1750s, the population ratio was something like six English persons to every Scot. England was on the cusp of becoming one of the most powerful nations in the world. Scotland had just suffered the terrible crisis of the seven or five lean years, the Darien disaster, the squeezing of Scottish trade through mercantilism, and the impact of European war in the later 17th century. It seemed that it was a condition of strength in one side of the relationship and a condition of weakness in the other side of the relationship. And the thing was, those Scottish members of parliament who voted for incorporative union may have thought that this was a foundational, eternal, and permanent treaty, but it wasn't. Because very soon after 1707, the Westminster Parliament, in which there was only a petty and semi-impotent group of 45 Scottish MPs, changed the ground plan in two important acts, the Toleration Act for Episcopalians, and even more important, the Patronage Act, which not only offended um, pious Presbyterians because it gave the final right of appointment to landowners rather than the Kirk Sessions and members of the church, a poisonous, a poisonous sore within the Kirk, which ended up in two secessions in the 1730s and early 1750s, and of course eventually the great destruction of 1843 and the emergence of the Free Church. Uh, there was also, also in the first half of the 18th century, almost a kind of revolution of frustrated expectations. The great hope was that the Union would be the panacea for all Scotland's late 17th century economic ills. By the time we get to the 1730s, the economy of Scotland, perhaps not, um, perhaps, uh, perhaps not uh, in the state of serious weakness it was in the 1690s, but it's still relatively inert. There was change, and this is an important phrase, there was change within the system, but not of the system, until we get to the 1760s, 1770s, and the great Scottish leap forward, which began in those, in those two decades. Uh, now, there's two indications that the Scots were already becoming fed up with the new Union Association a long-forgotten fact to begin with. In 1713, 
a motion to dissolve the Treaty of Union of 1707 was only beaten by five proxy votes in the House of Lords. But even more crucially and more familiar, we now know from the studies of colleagues looking at the Jacobite movement, and particularly at the risings, the risings of 1709, 1715, 1719, and 1745-6, that although Jacobitism was a crucial, sorry, Jac Jacobitism was a complex movement, one of its basic uh, stimuli was opposition to the Union. And so you could argue that the Jacobite development was almost a, how would you put it, a metaphor for the dislike of the Union, not throughout Scotland, because this is a, a regional set of loyalties and oppositions, but in some in some parts of Scotland. I think there's little doubt then that if you look at the period from 1707 to the 1750s, at least there is instability in the relationship. An instability which I'll try to show only came back again from the 1970s, 1980s. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the instability that we confront today and which the panel will address both in its current form and its likely future form at the end of the lecture. Um, what Scotland still feared by 1746 to 1750 was that the elephant would move into the bed or to the other side, the Scottish side of the bed, would not simply make noises on one side of the bed, but would actually start to crush the smaller neighbor. In a sense, what happened to Ireland eh, for much of the 17th and 18th centuries. But the classic example of this was the drawing in to the highlands of Scotland of three great Hanoverian armies as Charles Edward Stuart's forces retreated into the Highland Massif, supported by elements of the Royal Navy. After the disastrous defeat at Culloden, there was a systematic plan put into effect by the British state that this would never ever happen again. The original idea by Cumberland was to transport 50,000 clansmen and their families to the Caribbean. This was not put into effect. Instead, there was a systematic campaign of pillage, not only in the Jacobite areas, but in most parts of the Scottish Highlands and Islands led, ironically, by some psychopathic Scots, such as Major Caroline Scott, who probably resented his Christian name, and, and, therefore, <laughs> and therefore was determined to take it out uh, on, on everybody else. Um, then we move into the 1760s, 1770s. There's a period in the 1760s, 1770s, which is all still showing that the Scots are a distrusted lot by the elites in London. A, they're not allowed to bear arms under the Militia Act, and B, um, the rise of Scotophobia in the early 1760s. Um, it's poisonous, it's venomous, and it's racist, and it's livid especially in the cartoonery of the London prints. Let me give you two examples. Immense swarm of locusts above the London skyline, descending on the capital city. The interesting thing is that this swarm of locusts is dressed in tartan and playing bagpipes. This was a kind of uh, print, if you like, of the fear that this ragged nation to the north was going to be feasting on England's rich pastures in this new association. And then even more intriguingly, the first Scottish Prime Minister, uh, John Earl of Butte in the early 1760s, massive rumors going about of a sexual liaison between him and the Queen Dowager. Nobody knows whether this was correct or false, but it was certainly a rumor which went around the court and particularly in the metropole, in the metropolis itself. Um, Semi-pornographic prints of a well-endowed John uh, Butte, usually referred to in the cartoons as Boot, B-O-O-T, because he was tall, so he had long boots, um, and uh, in a carnal situation with the Queen Dowager. And this again was a kind of metaphor or a piece of symbolism for Scotland's increasing penetration 
of the English Empire and of the goodies in, in London. But then, this is the interesting thing, was we move to the next phase of this development. From about the middle part of the Napoleonic Wars, down to the 19, I would say, as late as the 1970s, both the elephant stays on its side of the bed, and the union relationship is relatively stable. There was a home rule movement in the late 18th century, but it was a, a movement for, if you like, making the union more effective, rather than any sense which had an independence agenda. Even the foundation of the SNP in the 1930s, the way I read that, is because of the fact that the mainstream parties, and especially the Liberals and Labour, were beginning to move back from a position of support for Scottish Home Rule. And the, the situation had become uh, so, if you like, unionist by the Victorian era, that historians have christened it banal unionism. In other words, it was not overt. It was simply a fact of conventional life. Nobody criticized it. Nobody even noticed it. It was simply part of the routine of everyday life. So the first analytical part of the lecture is why? In many states in the 19th century, where there was nationalist revolutions, the intelligentsia often led them or certainly influenced them, especially during the revolutionary period of 1848-9. In Scotland, the galactic stars of the Scottish Enlightenment were unionist to a man because they were all, or mainly, men. Not only that, but they rubbished the prehistory, the pre-union history of Scotland as factional, fanatical, um, intolerant, impoverished, and saw union as a liberation. So Scotland entered the early 19th century not with an, not, not with an intellectual elite, which was leading, if you like, an anti-union campaign or a strongly nationalist campaign, but one which was actually interested in what they called completing the union. That is an even more close association. And one of their obsessive, obsessive areas was there should not be this distinction between Scottish and English law because it's stopping the union being completed and that is having effect on free market transactions uh, in, in the common market which had been created after, after, 17, after 1707. That's a factor. A second factor was the Irish stab in the back. During the, during the period from about 1797 to 1805, Great Britain was at bay and faced with Napoleonic armies across the Channel. In 1798, a great rebellion began in Ireland, hoping for French help to support an invasion, a liberation of Ireland and, a, and an invasion of England. At the same time, Scotland became the most militarized society in the UK, not only through the, the, the well-known Highland regiments, but by the fact that as late as 1799, there were something of the order of 58,000 Scots in the Volunteer Corps. That was 33% of the relevant male age group compared to 12% in England. England never forgot that. In its hour of need, the Scots were loyal, especially in a militaristic sense. And we move on. It was by this time that that quite extraordinary development was occurring. The over-representation of Scots in the English Empire. The aphorism being spoken that England ruled the empire, but Scots were increasingly actually running it. In my Center for Diaspora Studies, which I have the honor to direct in this university, um, as we look at mer merchanting, governors, military officers, professors, medics, in almost all of these scales of professional or other influence, the Scots were overrepresented at a time when there were one in eight of the British population, in these cadres or strands of influence, they were often a quarter, a third, and particularly in areas like medicine, even, even greater than that. It beamed me up, Scotty. Star Trek, on the bridge, some Americans, of the Starship Enterprise, I mean, some Americans, a Japanese, a Russian, and a Canadian Irishman who speaks with a peculiar Scottish accent. <laughs> why did the producers select a small country of five million people 
because in the novels of the 19th century, the Scottish banker, the Scottish, yes, that was the case then, the Scottish accountant, the Scottish doctor, the Scottish minister, the Scottish professor, the teacher, and the engineer were often icons, um, ethnic icons of, of, this, of this nation. But I would argue that one of the prime reasons for the stability of the Union down to the Great War was that the elephant indulged Scotland with benign neglect, with benign neglect. It was a condition which we have come to call semi-independence. Uh, there were hardly any bills uh, passed in the Parliament in relation to Scotland. Those that were were usually made up by a Scottish cabal of MPs and then simply passed formally in the so-called sovereign parliament. Scotland itself, in a sense, ruled itself at the local level. The Kirk Sessions, the Borough Councils, the boards of supervision, and everything from lunacy to the prisons were made up of the Scottish bourgeoisie, the Scottish professional middle classes. And of course, one of the reasons why this was the case is because the state itself in this period was a bit of a pygmy. And so much of the activity, both in England and Scotland and Wales, took place at the local level. Of course, Westminster was sovereign in formality, but not really using that so so sovereignty because it goes back to the basic reason why England wanted the union, because it was its own, because of its own internal, internal security. And once that was preserved, there was no reason to be bothered with, with what went on in the north. Of course, then on to the period when one might expect the kind of instability in the relationship that we have seen over the last few years. The period from the Great War uh, down, to the, uh, down to 1939. The horrible experience of Scotland. One might even say the agony of Scotland between 1914 to the mid-1930s. Some scholars have argued that the nation lost more men per head of population in the fronts of Gallipoli and, the Western, uh, and Western Europe than any other combatant nation apart from the Serbs and the Turks, and they lost mainly through disease. That was an enormous, an enormous trajectory into the confidence of the nation. More worse than that sense was to follow. The great um, hegemonic global structure of Scottish heavy industry reeled in the 1920s and early 1930s in the years of Great Depression during that period, with a third of the west of Scotland male, male formally employed occupation, formally employed element, unemployed by 1931-32. And for the first time in Scotland's demographic history, at least in terms of known record from the mid-18th century, the emigration rate was so enormous that the population actually fell for the first time ever in Scottish history between 1921 and 1931. As one very distinguished journalist put it, the Scot is a man eclipsed. And one of the horrible consequences of that was the scapegoating by elements within the Scottish nation of the nation's biggest immigrant group, the Catholic Irish, many of whom are actually ironically not first-generation immigrants, but second, third, and fourth. But, and here's the irony, and Ruth will like this, between 1920 and 1939 of the seven general elections, the Conservatives got a majority in five of them in Scotland. Um, there was no evidence in the Labour Party of a switch to a nationalist directive or a nationalist solution. It seems to be the case that the depth of the crisis was such and was structural, in other words, it was ongoing, that the preference was the remaining armor plate, such as it was, of the British state. And of course, that was ongoing into the 40s, A, because of the extraordinary Britishness of that period, not simply Britishness during the war, of fighting the probably the worst and most evil foe that the nation had ever confronted. But, you know, moving into the period where I can remember in the late 40s and 50s, the comics, the war films, almost the obsession with the finest hour, a Britishness which was boosted considerably by the great takeoff in consumerism 
of the mid-50s, early to mid-50s onwards, and the housing revolution, uh, which took place at the same time as the great schemes were created um, and, uh, and, and the slums, or many of the slums, started to come down. And then what happened uh, in the period when the empire was disintegrating from the late 1940s onwards, a so-called bastion of the Union, a new, a new glue came on the scene, the welfare state, the cradle-to-grave security from the late 1940s, and in particular the National Health Service. Um, if you're dealing with a slightly or significantly disadvantaged nation, as Scotland was in the 1930s, you can imagine the euphoric appeal of the welfare state in the late 1940s, 50s uh, period. It was, it was almost like, dare I say it, uh, divine intervention. But that's with, a, that's with an I, by the way, ra 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 rather, rather than an E. Um, so what happens? Few could have predicted the last 30 odd years in Scottish history. And that's primarily, ladies and gentlemen, why I constantly mouth the cliche, the future is not my period. Because you never know what is round the corner. There are structural forces operating in human society, but there's also things out there which trigger things that are unexpected, and you never know what's going to, what's actually, what is actually, what is actually going, going to happen. As late as 1960, the Scottish National Party was not a party, it was a sect, hardly ever scoring more than 1% of the vote in national elections. In the 1950s, Scotland was a bastion, especially after Labour lost the election, the second election after, after the war, was a bastion of conservative, conservative unionism. I don't want to explain the reasons why we've got to this place. What I want, rather, is to give you a list in the last uh, two or three minutes of my presentation, a short list of those elements, and we do not know whether the union is, is going to end or continue, of course, of those elements which have caused, the phrase I'm going to use is, instability in the union. Obviously, the first is the rise of Scottish nationalism. The second is the elephant de de decidedly and vehemently in female form moved to the other side of the bed in the 1980s. I mean, it's, 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 it's important for you to realize in the long run of history that that movement which occurred in the 1980s had never occurred since the aftermath of the Jacobite Rebellion in 1745-6. That was why it was so decisive. The third thing is this. Our electorates are diverging. Conservatism, and we all wish Ruth the best of luck with the Herculean task which faces her. Um, the, the Conservative Party is still in a state of semi-disintegration. I've put the word semi in because Ruth's here. Um, uh, it's still in a state of semi I, I speak impartially, by the way, as an admirer of that great, uh, a great and ancient political party, but not as a member of same, by the way. Um, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the electoral patterns in England and Scotland are diverging. Scotland towards Labour and the SNP, both left, if you like, of centre. England still, to some extent, in the grip of, of um, a coalition government, which can, I think, be labelled authentically as, as right uh, of centre, but, you know, depends on how you define, define right. That had never happened before to the same extent concurrently earlier in the 20th century. The second thing is, so the next thing, possibly the most potent of all these variables is the rise of English nationalism. The way I see Euroscepticism, the way I see the behavior or the attempted behavior of Nigel Farage in the High Street or the Royal Mile in Edinburgh and the victories so far achieved and the votes so far achieved, this is a manifestation of the rise of English nationalism. And it's Perhaps not surprising then that more English people, according to recent opinion polls, demand Scottish independence than do Scots. Then the final thing is the grand old party. 
labor. It's obvious that if labor had still been the dominant force in the um, Scottish Parliament, there wouldn't be a referendum in September uh, 2014. The fact that there is going to be is a reflection of Scottish domestic policies and the overtaking, at least for a period, of the Scottish National Party by the uh, overtaking of the Labour Party by the Scottish National Party. In conversation with the, the most recent um, Labour PM a number of weeks ago, uh, Dr Brown, a distinguished alumnus of this university and especially of the Queen of All Disciplines, because he's got a, an MA in history and also a PhD, he put forward the three-point argument. Members of his party at the highest level are still not comfortable totally with devolution. I mean, we just have to look at Tony Blair's statement in his memoirs. He wishes it had never happened. Secondly, and equally importantly, he admitted that the big hitters had gone to Westminster and some of them, and none of them, apart from Dewar, had stayed in Holyrood. That seemed to send out, that seemed to send out a message. And the third thing was, he, he, the way he saw it, was a combination of the ossification of labour um, after so many years in a position of hegemony in Scotland and related to that concerns about the neoliberalism of new labour and, of course, the, 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 the Iraq war. So if you take these, these things together, these are, if you like, both manifestations of the instability and causes of the instability, and really then trying to set the scene uh, for the discussion of the question and answer uh, session which will take place uh, uh, from, from now on uh, this, the, the, this afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, I think that qualifies uh, for the adjective of magisterial. Um, a, a lecture that swept across eras, drawing out parallels between them, which throw uh, real insights into what's happening today. It was also wonderfully vivid. Uh, I, I didn't imagine a lecture which would combine the imagery of Star Trek uh, bagpipe playing locusts and Mrs. Thatcher as she-elephant. <laughs> Um, uh, and that, that was also part of the, the, the magisterial uh, quality. Uh, he set us up very well. Let me introduce uh, the panel. I'll go from, from that end to this. Uh, on uh, my uh, far left uh, is uh, Margot MacDonald. Uh, Forty years ago, Margot, um, a, a, a huge breakthrough. Glasgow governed by election. <laughs> Uh, and uh, a long career in nationalist uh, politics uh, since then, one of the most prominent uh, figures, uh, an MSP since 1999, initially for the SNP, and since 2003 uh, as uh, an independent. Um, I, I was debating with Margot whether we can call her an alumna of the university because she went to a college which became later part uh, of the university, and I, I'd like to claim her uh, as such. It's very good to have you here. <laughs> uh, next uh, to Margot is, is Dr. Nicola McEwen, a senior lecturer in uh, politics at the university uh, and one of the foremost uh, commentators on Scottish politics that we are fortunate enough in Scotland uh, to have. Uh, welcome, Nicola. Uh, directly to my left, Blair Jenkins, a, a long career uh, in, in the media including stints as, as head of news and current affairs for both STV and BBC uh, in, in Scotland, uh, and then became uh, a different kind of, uh, of animal as chief executive of, of Yes uh, Scotland, the uh, campaign for Scottish uh, independence, and uh, uh, studied English at this university, which is uh, it's great to have him back. Thank you for being here. Also studying English, um, at this university, Ruth Davidson, uh, who you may know better as uh, leader of the uh, Scottish uh, Conservatives, uh, an MSP uh, since 2011 and one of the key figures in the uh, Better Together campaign for remaining in the union uh, when we come to vote in the referendum next year. 
Tom Devine, you have uh, heard from, and he has been introduced uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and on the end, uh, on uh, the right there, is, is Willie Rennie, uh, leader of the Scottish uh, Liberal Democrats, uh, an MSP also since uh, 2011, also uh, uh, one of the key figures in the uh, Better uh, Together uh, campaign. Uh, it's great to have you, Willie, and all of the others uh, with us uh, to uh, debate some of the issues raised by uh, Tom's uh, 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 excellent presentation. Uh, we do want to have questions uh, from you, so do uh, please prepare them. Uh, I did uh, ask the colleagues uh, helping to organise this to, to drum up a couple just to get us going while you, uh, while you think of them. Uh, and they drummed up uh, one which was uh, pointed a bit towards the Better Together side and one which was pointed a bit towards the Yes uh, Scotland side. Uh, so may I start with Neil Stewart's question, um, which is, uh, we have been inundated with articles about the disasters that will befall us if we leave the Union, but we have not been given details of why it would be more beneficial for us to remain in it. We're only told that it would be better if we're together. Apart from avoiding those alleged disasters, we need to know, by remaining in the Union, how we could be better off than if we fully controlled our own affairs. I think that's uh, probably directed at, uh, at Ruth and then at Willie. Sure. Well, thanks very much for allowing me to kick off. And thanks to Tom here. I um, did study English here, but uh, I majored in Scottish literature and minored in Scottish history. So I remember mm -hmm. Tom as a lecturer who, I don't remember you being such an un, uh, unrequited ray of sunshine as you were today, but I think when you're <laughs> scampering through 410 years uh, of having an elephant in the bed beside you. Quite so. Uh, <laughs> but, it, you know, it's... Uh, it's I've got a part-time fuller undertaker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see why you might focus on some of the lover's tiffs down the years rather than the many hundreds of years uh, where we had the Great Scottish Leap Forward, we had the Scottish Enlightenment, where we saw ourselves as a nation uh, bring forward some of the foremost people of our age. Uh, we as a nation grew much richer, we as a, a nation had much more influence on the world. And I think to answer the question that, that Neil has put to us, Yes, there has been quite a lot in newspapers where we've talked about some of the assertions that have been made um, by the Yes campaign. Some of it is the Scottish National Party. Um, but I don't think that asking questions or saying, have you spoken to people when you say that we can automatically enter the European Union, when you say um, we will keep the pound uh, in a currency union with the Bank of England, asking them, have you actually asked the European Union? Have you actually asked the Bank of England if this can be so? I don't think that is doing Scotland down. And I don't like being called unpatriotic for asking tough questions of how will this actually work? Because I think people out there have a right to know how things would actually work and they have a right to know information before they go there. But I also think that there is a huge positive case for the United Kingdom. And I think that that's one that's both of the heart and also of the head and, and of the pound in the pocket. There's a reason why we're in the G8 group of nations, why they were meeting in Northern Ireland just a couple of weeks ago. It's because we have the size, the scale, we have the entrepreneurship, we have the rules that allow businesses to flourish here, we have the embassy network around the world, which now each embassy is gonna have a, a trade ambassador in it, that allows us to go out uh, and be uh, still uh, an incredibly uh, economically viable and uh, proud and also wealthy nation relative to the rest of the world. I think in terms of... 40% of children who are born into poverty. Well, I think there are huge issues surrounding disparity within uh, both Scotland and across the UK. And I think that uh, one of the great crimes is that uh, in the Scottish Parliament, we haven't used all the powers that we have to address them on these shores. But in talking about why the UK can go on to even better things, I think the best days are still ahead of us. I think that there's a lot that we do around the world in terms of soft diplomacy. I think there's a lot we do around the world uh, in terms also uh, of being able to help other nations. Um, before I became a politician, I was... Uh, a reporter and when I was a very young reporter I was sent to Kosovo um, just uh, after the war ended there and when it was still a theatre uh, and I saw some of the work that the British Army did uh, abroad. I saw children being protected as they went to try and get schooling, primary school kids and we stopped them from being shot. I saw bombs in people's houses uh, under the beds of children. I saw what people wearing the colours of our country did to protect folk <coughs> on the shores of our continent who'd been subject to ethnic cleansing 
and brutality. And I was proud. I was incredibly proud to be British. I remain incredibly proud to be British. So I think there's arguments of the head as well as the heart. I think we can go on to bigger and better things, I think, in terms of being of a size, a scale, of having a power in the world that we can have greater wealth going forward. But it's not all measured in pounds and pockets. It's measured in identity too. I'm proud to be Scottish. I've never lived or worked anywhere else. I love my country. But I'm proud to be British too, and I don't see why someone gets to take one half of that away from me without giving me very much in return, and they've not made that argument for me yet. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I, I think if we can summarise Neil Stewart's question as, why is Better Together so negative in its messages? Um, do you agree with Neil? I, I, I mean, if there is, I mean, whenever you're challenging something and encouraging people to vote no, inevitably you're going to be arguing against their proposition. So in, in its very nature, it has to be negative. Um, but I think what you'll see with the UK government's papers that they're publishing, and there's another one was published on Friday, is just an analytical, detailed establishment of what the United Kingdom means. And I think that's one of the benefits of this referendum process. We might understand our country a little bit more at the end of this than we understood at the beginning. So whatever the result is, I think we may be in a better position to exploit the opportunities ahead. Um, but I think there are three main benefits for the United Kingdom, and these are the things that I talk about repeatedly whenever I do meetings like this, although I have to say, I don't think I've done one as big of this for some time, and actually with such an excellent speaker at the beginning. Um, but the clout in the world, um, social equity, and economic strength. I think those are the three main reasons why the United Kingdom is good for Scotland. Now, economic strength, you might say in the middle of a recession, is that really a strength? But what we're really looking at here is over the next 300 years plus, because the union has lasted for 300 years. And you've seen from Tom's presentation, it has been through some volatile times, but it's been through those volatile times and survived and protected Scotland in that process in different forms but it has survived. So you've got to look over the longer term. Clout in the world, whenever you see in advance of any big European summits or world summits, the big nations of the world get together. They set the agenda. These are the ones that call the shots. Now, whether we like it or not, that's the way world politics works. Whether we agree with everything the United Kingdom wants to do, I would rather be in there shaping the agenda of the world rather than being on the outside shouting from the back of the room. I think it's much better to be on the inside there. And then social equity. The welfare state has actually radically reformed the United Kingdom and improved the standards of people who live there. So I think it's really something we should celebrate. Now, would Scotland be without a welfare state? No, it wouldn't. But we've got to recognise that it was the United Kingdom that created that welfare state. If it can create something as good as that, it can go on to create good things in the future as well. Uh, thank you very much, Willie. Just as a matter of interest, how many of those present today will have a vote next year? Could you give me a quick show of hands? Okay, so th there's, there's some incentive for uh, our panellists uh, this afternoon. Uh, let, let me, let me uh, pose the second question, and after that uh, we, we will move to you, the audience. And this is, is focused more at, uh, at Blair and at Margot. Uh, if Scotland becomes independent and chooses to keep sterling, how can the Scottish Government keep the Bank of England as the country's central bank and still claim to have complete fiscal autonomy? Oh, it wouldn't, surely to goodness it wouldn't. This is a big mistake that Alex Salmon has made. He's tried to do everything signed, sealed and delivered before we've even selected from the shelf. If we become independent, there's at least two or three different ways in which we can organise our economy and currency. And what I want to see and what I'd like to see the SNP doing as the government is lay out a straight exposition of the three ways of doing it and say quite openly, we have favoured such and such for the following reasons. If circumstances change, we'd be pretty stupid not to change with them. So would you ask him if he would do that, Blair? <laughs> Do we see some signs of division on this side of the debate? <laughs> I, I, I wonder. Uh, Blair. If, uh, if only I had that kind of uh, sway or that kind of influence over, over the First Minister. Um, I think this is, one of those, uh, this is one of those areas where you do get differences of opinion on the, on the yes side of the argument. Um, there, are, there are close colleagues of mine who take the view that Scotland should, from the very beginning, as an independent country, have its own currency. 
Um, there, are, there are still, you, you may find it hard to believe, there are still people around who, who actually think that going into the euro is a good idea. There are, you do still come across people who think that's a good idea. I think what we would say collectively across the, um, the yes side of the argument is that um, the starting position, the, the basis on which an independent Scotland should be built, would be on the, on the basis of being uh, part of the sterling zone. And I think it's interesting that even economists uh, in other parts of the UK who, who are by no means supporters of the concept of Scottish independence believe that it would be good not only for Scotland but for the rest of the UK for the countries, countries to continue in, uh, in, a, in one currency, in a currency zone, uh, when Scotland becomes independent. Now, I do think, uh, without um, intruding into uh, economic policy any further than I dare, I, I think it is perfectly feasible to have cooperation and coordination in monetary policy and control of money supply, uh, and to have divergence in, in fiscal policy in what you do with your powers over things like uh, welfare and taxation. So I believe that uh, the, the vote, when Scotland comes to vote in the autumn of next year, the proposition that we've put forward, because I do expect it to be in the Scottish Government's white paper, is that from the point of, uh, of becoming independent, we would remain part of uh, the sterling zone, that, that optimal currency zone. If at a future date, the people of Scotland wish to switch to another option, which is perfectly feasible and by, by all means possible at a later date, then I'm sure that's uh, something that would happen. Okay, thank you very much. One, one final thing. I, I said I'd go to the audience. I'm going to ask uh, Nicola and Tom uh, what they make of the campaign so far in terms of, of tone and content on either side. Nicola. Um, I was thinking when, when Ruth was talking about Kosovo and, and other places around the world, I think there's something that we can be quite proud of in, in Scotland, that we can have this debate. We're having it in... in it's politically contentious, it gets a bit heated, but it's peaceful. There's no violence here. And I think that that's something that we should be proud of. And I think also, if the referendum did result in a majority in favour of independence, then I think that creates enormous opportunities um, for both partners in subsequent developments. We've heard a lot in the last few days about how the rest of the UK would be diminished in the world if Scotland became independent. Maybe, uh, in some eyes, but I think there would also be opportunities to show the world how it's done peacefully uh, to, to well, negotiate a, a, a new relationship. So, um, but I think in, in general, I think, the campaign is maybe a little flat, but it's, it's peaceful and we should be proud of it. Czechoslovakia have already demonstrated, the people, uh, the Slovaks, and the, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have already shown the world that it can be done. Mm -hmm. And we, we're a bit, I think we're a bit, uh, too gratuitous in praising ourselves for having done things like this first and foremost. Yes, we can do better. I believe that. And I believe that it's, it's absolutely inevitable that we've still got to hear that there'll be a plague of boils will infest this if we vote for independence. It's becoming that ridiculous, a daily disaster. But let's not forget <laughs> that in every department of the government, and I am not neurotic in this, there's somebody working to make sure that we don't say yes. We have the, the, the organs of the state tipped against us and we're trying to play with a straight bat if that's not too much of a mixed I'm, metaphor. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump in here, Margot, because the idea that the arguments that are being put forward from, from the side of the House are a plague of boils will descend upon us is clear hyperbola. And it's that sort of stuff that actually we all have to pull back from our side as well, because whatever happens on the 18th of September next year, as a nation, we have to come back again, uh, back together again on the 19th of September, whichever way we vote. So I think that we have to work incredibly hard to make sure that we have, uh, even if it is a little bit flat, we have a debate that's decent. We have a debate that I hope is thorough, in some ways can be challenging, but most of all is in that good British old fashioned way of being polite because there will be divisions within households, there'll be divisions within workplaces and elsewhere, and we all have to come back together again afterwards. Thank you. I, think, I think, just to, to say, I think referring back to, to Tom's uh, very excellent lecture, I think just as the welfare state was one of the, if you like, one of the great underpinnings of the, of the concept of, of the United Kingdom in the, in the post-war years, I think it's the erosion of the welfare state currently that's providing yeah. one of the key platforms for mm, the independence yes. campaign. Um, there's no, it is no accident, I think, that uh, the, the period of the rise of, of, of belief in uh, independence as a right future for Scotland in the last 30 plus years exactly coincides with the period 
when the UK has produced more inequality at, fast, at a faster rate than any other developed country in the world. And the people I meet, uh, and I meet a great deal of them, who've shifted from uh, an intention to vote, uh, to vote no, or from a position where they were previously supporters of the union, to a position where they're going to be voting yes, I have to say an extraordinarily high percentage of those people are people who think that becoming the fourth most unequal country on the planet and seeing the gradual erosion of the welfare state is not the direction of travel that they wish to take. So I, I do think that just as... <laughs> I think... I think the story, the story of the UK for more than 30 years now has been the story of the erosion of the ideal of social equality and equal opportunity. And I think what we get next year in Scotland is the opportunity to begin to write a different story. Uh, Willie, Willie Rennie would like to come in, but, but could, I, could I point that question a bit more towards you, uh, Willie? Um, how much of an asset for you is Ian Duncan Smith in the... <laughs> The, 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 the current debate. I, mean, I, I think what you saw there was an example of how the Yes campaign were being negative about the United Kingdom. Um, now, they, what they do is they criticise the No camp for being purely negative. But what we don't get from the Yes camp in the you same, in the same, no, just wait, hold on, in the same <laughs> argument that Blair has just made, what you don't get is a setting out of what the welfare state would look like in Scotland and how they would pay for the two and a half billion pounds worth of cash that would be required in order to reverse the changes that Westminster has implemented. So all you're doing is just being negative about it. What you really need to do is to set out what it would look like and you don't get those kind of answers. And that's why we get kind of frustrated that whenever we ask those questions, we're just accused of being negative. We need to have some answers because we need to live in the real world. The welfare state was burdening it out of control. It was actually suppressing people into keeping them in unemployment. We needed to change the welfare system. And what we don't need is people just saying, yeah, boo, it doesn't work. We need people to come up with alternatives and just saying it's wrong is not enough. Okay. Very interesting. We're already getting rounds of applause on both sides of the argument. Uh, Tom, do you think the citizens of Scotland are currently being well served by what they're hearing from both sides? Uh, well, I mean, just a, a set of very brief reactions. First of all, I mean, I do believe with Alex Salmon's uh, interview in the New Statesman that um, we're still in a condition of phony war. I think the, certainly in terms of those people who are interested in this, like people from the academic background that uh, Nicola and I have, I've, I've certainly found it fascinating, but it's, I'm not absolutely convinced yet that it's a, yet a burning issue, which it will undeniably become mm -hmm. in a certain period. Because I do believe, and I hope it happens in a dignified way, the gloves will come off. And don't forget, we are a, I mean, historically, we are a tremendously argumentative people. We invented the great medieval tradition of flighting. Ritual humiliation of the opponent by verbal violence. <laughs> and then after it, everybody's friends. Oh. And not only that, we go for a drink. That's, okay? That's the way we should be doing it. It should be bitter at the point, but it's not personalised. Third thing is, I find it fascinating looking at the way things are developing. Um, I reviewed Ian McWhirter's book on his television programme in The Herald recently. In the last paragraph, I was arguing for uh, a sinister convergence that's going on between the so-called opposing parties. You know, somebody's already mentioned the bank, you know, the currency issue. There's also the issue of the Queen, and there's a whole variety of other things apparently going on in the SNP part, you know, the, the shading down in a way I don't think, I don't think uh, you, you, you would really like uh, happening, but that is, the, the, if you like, the, the hardcore nationalism is beginning to be slightly diluted. And at the same time, and I know this for certain, plans in back rooms, not smoky, but plans in back rooms, especially in the Labour Party, are currently being forged to try and shoot the nationalist fox by formulations of devolution maximus, which will be solemnly solemnly promised in manifestos, but you won't hear about that 
for another at least another four or five or six months. Aka, when the phony war has finished and blitzkrieg, blitzkrieg begins. Well, can, can I say something at this point? Tom has referred to the parties. I take exception to this <coughs> referendum being taken over by the parties. It's nothing to do with the parties. Yeah. It's the people. Mm -hmm. It's every Scot and the eventual total determination of all Scots will determine which way they're going. And I get fed up with the ritual disembowelment that goes on every Thursday up in the, the Cannon Gate because the rest of Scotland isn't bothered about it. They know it's a piece of theatre. And last week, when you were saying there's no hatred, Tom, you could have cut the air with a knife. There was no, visceral no, I'm not, hatred I'm, in I'm not saying that it, I'm not saying there isn't hatred. I've been there as well. Yes. And I've seen it in the so-called corridors and even in the restaurant and even in the bar of that particular establishment. There's definitely personalised... in the bar, that was good that you could still see it, but... but, <laughs> but um, by the way, I was only passing through. But the, but, 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 but the, point, the point I was making, the point I was making was that at the party level at least, where the formulations of different approaches yeah. have to take place, I detect an increasing, an increasing extent of convergence of policy, mm -hmm. where we may actually, when we get closer to the referendum itself, we may end up with a situation of semi-independence, which is pretty close to devolution maximus, especially if that devolution max goes in the kind of direction that I suspect. But they're doing it from the point of view of their party's interests. Of course, interests. absolutely. Not of the, okay. not of the interests of good government. No, 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 really no. interesting, no, it's a really interesting point. I promise you it's interesting. Very quickly then, Ruth. It will be brief, uh, is that Marco's right, this isn't a party political debate, even though the parties are having an argument about it and have different positions. Because some interesting research has been done about who votes for what parties and what they believe at the referendum. And not all the people that support a party support the party's position. Only 61% of SNP supporters in 2011 support independence. That's less than two thirds, which is a massive, massive disconnect between party politics in this country and the views of individual people at the referendum. So there is a lot of work for people to do in campaigns, which are being headed and led by parties, to speak to those people who don't really listen to what political parties' views are, even though they vote for them at elections. Except when they're being led by people who don't have a party political background. Absolutely. Well, there we go. Let's, let's move into, um, into the area that Margo said, Margo said we should be in, and that's hearing the views of the ordinary members of the public rather than uh, the political parties. So let's uh, start off. We'll start off with the three hands, four hands over here. We'll take uh, a couple in one go. Uh, microphones will be given to you. Please tell us who you are and please keep your contribution short. Hello, uh, my name is Alex Grant. I'd like to ask particularly Professor Devine, but the other panelists as well, uh, because he didn't mention what I consider to be a major impact on the on the rise of this particular debate, which is uh, the politics of the United Kingdom seem to be designed to satisfy the southeast of England. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Not England, the southeast of England. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a significant issue here that Professor Bryan didn't refer to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right behind you, can you pass the microphone back? Thank you, Peter McCall. Uh, at risk of uh, running contrary to the, uh, the points that have just been made, I, I, I wondered if perhaps the uh, the key agent in all of this is actually uh, a party that's not represented at the top table, and that's the Labour Party. And not the Scottish Labour Party, but the British Labour Party, because I think the crucial driving uh, force in, in pushing independence forward has been the abandonment by the Labour Party of a left-wing position that Scottish people felt comfortable with. The triangulation from, 1990, well, from 1994 onwards of the Labour Party into right-wing territory, I think, um, uh, in, in the area that the, the previous questioner uh, dealt with, uh, of, of pandering to the southeast of England, is the thing that makes people want independence and that's, is the thing that's put the SNP in power and has put a referendum on the table. And I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Somebody just behind you. Yep. 
Hello, uh, I'm Matthew D'Agostino, and I have a couple of points, a point related to the economy that I'd like to address to Miss Davidson and Mr. Rennie. Miss Davidson, you talked of pounds in pockets as being a reason for being in support of the union. And Mr. Rennie, you referred to economic strength as one of the three reasons that you gave, again, in defense of the union. However, you didn't address any specifics to do with the UK economy that uh, will actually bring this strength, considering that some recent data shows that foreign direct investment is growing faster in Scotland than in the UK as a whole, and arguably the unemployment is actually now falling faster in Scotland than in the United Kingdom as a whole. How can you defend your assertions that economic strength is a reason to remain in the union? Okay, thank you. Right beside you. <laughs> yes. uh, Alan Brown, first of all, would I, I'd like to congratulate Professor Tom Devine, spelt with an I, on his majestic um, overview. And the second question is to the whole panel. In view of the fact that recent polls show that only 20% of 17-year-olds are going to vote for independence, in view of the fact that only over the last six, seven years, 30, 35% of the adult population are going to vote for independence, and in view of the fact that uh, Alex Salmond has lost total credibility over many issues, including the European Union and the legal issues, what is the point and future of the Yes campaign? Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll... <laughs> we, we will pause at that point uh, and, and take another, uh, another round in a moment. And I'll come to this side, don't worry, don't worry. But let's, let's start off with, with Blair. Um, the polls are not looking that wonderful. Um, how do you see the way to make them better from your perspective? Um, I think the, the fundamental truth about where public opinion is in Scotland at the moment is that the majority of people are still open to the debate and are still persuadable, one way or another, to be fair. You know, they're not suggesting that the people who are still undecided will all end up voting yes. But there is absolutely no doubt, I mean, and as you might imagine, we do lots and lots and lots of our own research right around the country and in lots of different ways. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that there is a majority there to be won for independence if we can get the arguments right, make the case properly, which we fully intend to do, do over the next year. I'd link that, if I may, just very briefly to the, the points made about, um, about the economy and the economic aspect of this debate. The really important thing about the economic dimension to the independence debate is that I would say historically, the great obstacle to what was always a lot of sentiment in favor of Scottish independence, the great obstacle was people's reluctance to believe that the Scottish economy was strong enough and resilient enough for Scotland to be an independent country. That obstacle to the debate is being removed and I think is not proving to be an insurmountable obstacle in this, in this referendum campaign. I think people are now forming the view uh, and, and, and they have the data to, to demonstrate this view, to prove and, and validate this view, that the Scottish economy is strong enough to, for us to be a very thriving and prosperous country. So the two classic questions about uh, Scottish independence were always, could Scotland be an independent country and should Scotland be an independent country? Could has been answered. I, don't think, I think the could question has largely gone away. Could Scotland be a, a prosperous independent country? And the debate as we go forward will focus more and more and more on the, on, on the should question. And I believe, my, my own view is that uh, given that confidence in the resilience of the Scottish economy, that people's natural uh, attraction to the idea of independence will win out in this debate. Uh, Nicola, <coughs> you've been known to, to write about opinion polls. How, how do you judge uh, what they show at the moment? I think they are um, quite consistent and they are revealing of opinion as it is today. I think they tell us little or nothing about what will happen a year and a half or, or so from, from now. Um, one of the lessons from campaigns elsewhere, um, for example in Quebec in the run-up to their independence referendum a while back, is that the campaign itself does matter. It matters in shaping opinion, in focusing attention on issues we're all engaged. You are engaged to the extent that you're here, um, but for many people out there it's not really uh, the burning issue as, as, as Tom said. And there's lots of things that can happen between now and then to, to shift opinion in either direction, actually. And one of those 
um, I want to pick up on something that Tom said about the convergence uh, between the two sides. I agree with that to some extent, but there's a big difference between a Devolution Max position and an Independence Light position, and that's membership of the European Union. Now, there's another potential referendum on the horizon, potentially, and that's about the UK's membership of the European Union. Now, that will likely um, come higher up the agenda in the months running up to the referendum next year because of the European parliamentary elections. Um, and that's the sort of thing that could shape opinion here. Another issue taking place largely around a debate somewhere else that could shift opinion here because it would affect Scotland's position, not just within the UK, but yeah. within Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you. Can I, can I, uh, Margo wants to follow on on that. But there's, I, I, there's evidence to show that what you've just said is the truth of the situation. Events, dear boy, events. <laughs> At the last election, and there must be some people in the hall other than me, who remember at the last referendum, I mean, the, the whole issue became embroiled in the business of the, west, the winter of discontent, um, people being fed up with the Labour Party, and with this fresh young filly waking in the wings. And everybody forgot what the, the referendum was meant to be about, and it became the party political maelstrom. So that's, you're absolutely right. And there's a great deal and in the, in the world window of events could well happen to throw this off course. And I think sometimes, with all due respect, the folk running, should I call it that, the SNP campaign, forget it. <laughs> I, I, I hate to, to remind you of 40 years ago again, uh, Margo, but I wanted to, wanted to you to address Peter McColl's point, which Tom also made, that um, some of the opportunities uh, for um, presenting the case for independence appear to be linked to the UK Labour Party. Uh, you, you beat them in 1973, you've been having a go at them periodically uh -huh. since. Do you, do you see that? Um, I think what, what was said from the floor is correct. The, the position of the British Labour Party is all important. And I don't want to take up too much of this because I can give you a whole thesis on this. But step forward, Gordon Brown. You see if Gordon came out to play again and started to play in politics in Scotland and started to put things right, because I can't see there being any other big figure for Labour folk to coalesce behind. And that's what they're looking for. And that's no, no slight on Joanne, whom I like very much and he really value. He is coming, value. he is coming. Ah, well, you see, if that's the case, great. Bring him on, as someone once said. <laughs> Remember Hitler? Okay. No, I don't During the Battle remember of Britain, do you remember Hitler? <laughs> they think, you know, we are not coming. We are I coming. Mm. Okay. Uh, I wanted to, to pick up on those two points about the economy, the, the, the interests of the South East uh, being uh, dominant and these indicators of good economic news uh, in Scotland. Uh, does that um, make your position more difficult, uh, Ruth, when uh, those perceptions can be well, I think there was two questions. The first from Alex was about, um, he asked about the, the politics trying to satisfy the southeast of England. Well, I think there's a very clear demonstration that people in the southeast of England don't think that is in that they traditionally vote Conservative and voted Conservative in the southeast right away through 13 years of Labour government, didn't get a Le Labour government. So politically, their aspirations weren't fulfilled. So, uh, you know, it's the same as every other part of the UK. It's the whole of the UK that you look at when you're electing a Westminster government. In terms of Matthew's point, which was the economic point, he asked us to talk about some economic indicators that show that the UK is a good thing. Well, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I, I think the fact that you see us as part of the G8 group of, of the, the wealthiest economic nations in the world shows that we have a, a might around the world. I think if you look at the fact that we have some of the lowest borrowing costs in the world, and that translates to individuals because we have very low mortgage rates at the moment, shows our strength around the world. If you look at the fact that we've got a stable currency, and you only have to look at the knots that the other side are tying themselves into about whether it would be Euro currency union with sterling uh, or a, a Scottish bobby or whatever, that you see that that's not something that you can take for granted. If you look at the strength of the Bank of England boasts as a, a lender of, of last resort. If you look at the fact uh, of how we have a, a UK-wide regulator, things that would be um up for grabs, if you like, if we had to reapply uh, to the European Union. If you look at the questions that ICAS, not 
us on the Better Together side, but the independent uh, group of chartered accountants in Scotland who were raising questions of a £29 billion black hole uh, were Scotland to go independence. If you look at the 12,000 international treaties that we've signed with nations around the world, if you look at the foreign, di- even the point you made about foreign direct investment in Scotland, um, you know, that is happening in a devolved Scottish context. So that can be argued on both sides of this. Are they, uh, are they investing here because we've got a very low rate of corporation tax that's going to go down to 20% over the next two years? Is it because we have a stable currency? Is it because we have very low borrowing rates? Is it because we're a stable economy? These things can be answered on both sides. So I think if you look at the economics of this, yes, there absolutely are very good reasons why the UK, yes, there has been a world recession, but the UK is coming back from that and is in a much better position than many countries around the world and is using its strength to maximise that position. Okay, we're going to take another round of questions. I saw a lady over here. Right, there's, I've got four in close proximity here. Um, we'll take those. Keep your hands up. That's it. A very entertaining and informative uh, afternoon. Do tell us uh, who my you name are. is Moira, uh, Moira Stewart and uh, I, my question really was almost answered um, by, by Margot or, or alluded to by Margot. If it's, I think Paul, it's very exciting just now in Scotland and, the, and I think there's everything to pray for. I don't think it's a, a, a done deal yet at all. Uh, I would like to think it would be an independent Scotland, uh, but if it's a close run thing and it's a no vote, and then the uh, European question and the rise of English nationalism takes us out of Europe. What a disaster for Scotland. Okay, thank you very Your much. Comments. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it's amazing that we really up here. <laughs> Hello, David Peacock. I'm Anglo. I'm married to a Scot, not the lady who just spoke. Let me. (laughs) There's time. Tom Devine reminded us that really one of the most important exports that Scotland has ever had is its people. And that's still happening. Margot, you said this isn't about parties, it's about the people. One of the things that worries me. I am a long-term resident of Scotland. I get the vote. There are many Scots who are not living in Scotland who still feel this is their home. They haven't got a vote. No. Is this right, or is this a fundamental flaw in the process? No, okay. that's right. Thank you. You chose to be here. They chose no. to be there. Okay. Well. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, my name's Jim Dyer. Uh, Willie Rennie gave us one of his three arguments for staying in the Union, that Scotland has more clout in the world if it's within the Union. Now, one of the difficulties with that argument is that under current arrangements, Scotland doesn't have the power to decide how that clout is used, since foreign affairs and defence are reserved to Westminster. Were Scotland to become able to uh, develop its own foreign policy and defence policy, How do the panel think, uh, what sort of divergence would there be between Scotland and the rest of the UK with particular reference to nuclear weapons? Okay, thank you. So a man in, more in the middle there, he's got a a raised blue shirted arm, there we are. That'll be the last one in this round. Uh, Jim Pringle. Tom Devine, in his lecture, made reference to Scotland's self-confidence and how it was hit at various times in the last 300 years. <coughs> um, Tom's also very fond of drawing our attention to a cartoon that appeared in the Glasgow Herald just after the 79 referendum when the Scottish lion asks if it's okay to go back into its cage. Mm-hmm. So I wonder what the panel would think if we voted no, what would the effect be on the nation's self-confidence? Okay. Yep. Mm. Um, I'll let Tom start and I'm going to go to Willie directly afterwards. It's just very quickly on the last one because um, it's time we started to address this salient and very important issue. There was um, a BBC uh, debate uh, held in my own um, birthplace in Motherwell uh, a number of, I think a few months ago, with young people. And there was no doubt that the most penetrating question asked 
by a 17-year-old, I think from Thurzo, because they came from all over the, the country, was the one you've just posed. God help Scotland if there's no alternative, which is a solemn alternative to independence and if the vote goes against independence. I, th I think our politicians quite seriously and solemnly have to consider that because, as some people have already said in the last few minutes, it might coincide with a crisis in relation to the UK's membership mm -hmm. of the Union and the bigger Union, that is the European one. Okay. Can I, I, I wanted to point that at, at Willie anyway, as, as, as a member of a party and as an individual strongly committed to European integration and membership of the European Union, how do you view the, uh, some of the tone of the debate in the Conservative Party at Westminster in its relationship to Scotland's debate? Um, I think there's a contradiction, um, I'm afraid to say, Ruth, in um, some of the arguments that are used about the European Union and about independence for Scotland. Um, I think there's a benefit of being in the United Kingdom and a benefit of being in the European Union. And um, to argue that uncertainty in one doesn't, um, isn't, is bad, but uncertainty in the other is, is OK, I don't think is consistent. But I think the, the really interesting question there is about Scotland's self-confidence. And I, I reject the arguments that some people make on my side that Scotland is too poor and too stupid. Because I don't think it is. I think it's well capable of being a vibrant, successful nation. I think that's, that is something that we must convince people through this process, through the referendum. And I want them, with that confidence, to believe that we can stay in the United Kingdom and punch above our weight within the United Kingdom rather than feeling the only way that we can express ourselves is by being independent. But we should do it from a point of confidence rather than dependency. And I think that's really important that we come out of this referendum believing in ourselves and what we are capable of doing. And to address Tom's point about what is next, I'm passionately in favour of more powers for the Scottish Parliament on two fronts. The first is more financial powers, because I think it's ludicrous that a Parliament can spend loads of money that doesn't raise it. Um, if you're going to have a proper Parliament that makes proper decisions, it needs to have the tax raising powers to go with it. So we need to have a massive transfer of financial power. The second one is, many people will be surprised to hear that the Scottish Parliament is actually just a temporary institution. It could go at any point. Westminster could legislate at any point. It could go. I think we need to make the Scottish Parliament a permanent institution so it's a more equal partner within the United Kingdom. And being an equal partner within the United Kingdom, I think means that we can assert much more authority within that partnership. And that deals with the issue about the southeast of England. Now, I, I used to live in Cornwall for about seven years. And people in Cornwall used to refer to London as upcountry. And it was derogatory. It was always people up there got a better deal than people down here. And wherever I go within the United Kingdom, they always feel the other part of the United Kingdom gets a better deal. <coughs> now, I think in some cases that will be the case but it will change over time. And what we need to recognise that is together we are stronger and we need to recognise what we can do with the United Kingdom. The current constitutional settlement is not sustainable. It needs to change. And I think it's federalism and I think it's home rule. And with that, I think we can deal with that point of making sure that we settle yeah, the yeah, constitutional yeah, issue. Yeah, yeah, but Willie, you need to be in power in Westminster That's to right. do that. That's yes, you do. And would the... Would the would, would the red-haired one from Lochaber, mm. who's in cabinet at the moment, no. would yes. he allow you to do it? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I think, and I I'm think, glad to hear that. Absolutely. I think, I think however, the biggest I, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think you know to can, whom can I am I just, referring. Can I just do one more point? Because I think the big issue here, I recognise mm. we might not be in a majority at Westminster after the next mm. election. We might just not achieve that. And I think, however, what we need to do is to convince Ruth's party and the Labour Party that home rule, federalism is the way ahead or more powers in the way that I've described. And I think there are very, very positive signs that we're actually getting there, that there is a recognition in both parties across the UK that a sustainable constitutional settlement is achieved by what I'm suggesting. Uh, excuse me, do you really believe, Willie, that in the southeast of England, which has correctly been identified as the driver 
that they'll be sitting in the saloon bar saying, these nice Scotch people didn't vote for independence. What can we do for them? A win, no be done. Yeah, that point, yeah, really, a point. Yeah. An important, an important point about the, the economy in and around London is that uh, it was a, a UK statistics body, not a Scottish uh, statistics body, which produced um, uh, some new figures a few months ago. And it showed what had happened in employment around the UK in the five years since the, the banking crisis. And you can almost literally see the jobs being sucked from the rest of the UK into London. There is a net increase. Through those years of financial turmoil, there is a net increase in London of almost 300,000 jobs and a net decrease in the rest of the UK of exactly the equivalent number, almost 300,000 jobs. I think, the, the, and this is something that uh, Willie's coll colleague uh, Vince Cable has conceded, the UK economy is largely run for the benefit of the southeast of England, and that's just the reality of the modern day UK. Willie also made a great, great play on the, uh, the benefits of being part of a larger country. There is now compelling evidence, not just from Europe, but from all parts of the globe, that smaller countries are doing better in all sorts of ways, not just in economic outcomes, but in educational outcomes, in health outcomes, in all the things that measure real quality of life and not just money. Smaller countries are leading the way. They come top of all the indices. They come top of the United Nations Human Development Indices. I think of all the numbers, and both sides in the, the campaign use lots and lots of statistics, the one I think that, that both, both, both sides in the campaign would really agree, the one statistic we've got to tackle, and I believe only independence will allow us to do this, is the fact that we have the lowest life expectancy in Scotland of any country in Western or Central Europe. Now, the World Health Organization will tell you that those sorts of mortality rates are directly linked to economic inequality. That is the main driver of, of, of those sorts of health outcomes. Until we control the levers of economic power in Scotland, we will continue to be at the bottom of that league table. Okay. I, I want to come back to, to Blair and Margot in a minute, but I, <clears throat> I didn't want to let Ruth off the hook on, on Europe. Well, we were asked them with nuclear weapons. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and to ask Ruth how far um, she might see um, Euro scepticism in the southeast of England, uh, largely in the Conservative Party, um, as uh, a challenge for um, a coherent position. Uh, here about the benefits of, of union, if that could lead to a situation in which we leave the, uh, the bigger union. I'd also like to hear a little bit about whether your, uh, your working group on, on further powers from the Scottish Parliament is, is yet working, uh, and, and if so, uh, which directions you might encourage it to work in? Well, uh, there's a lot in that. I'll start by saying, first of all, you know, there are always uh, scare stories and, and sceptics and people with uh, conspiracy theories that uh, the southeast of England or the English Tories won't do this or they won't do that. Um, you know, if, if, if Scotland wants it to happen, they'll just ignore it. But I think we have to look at, at um, recent history on this one. Um, you know, David Cameron was told that he'd never Im implement the Calman Commission. Well, the Scotland Act was one of the first pieces of legislation that went through uh, under the coalition government. Um, Alex Salmond tried to say that this, the UK government would never let him have his referendum. Well, we all saw the agreement that was signed here in Edinburgh. So in terms of doing what it says it's going to do in relation to Scotland, actually the current coalition government has a pretty decent record on that. Um, in terms of uh, the European referendum, which is going forward, I'm looking forward to that, should there be a Conservative majority after the 2015 general election. It's right that you put out in your manifestos what you're going to do if you're going to get into power. The, Scot uh, the, the UK Conservative Party says that it will offer a referendum. And the reason that I welcome that is because I'm 34 years old. Uh, I've never had my say on Europe. I've never said whether I want to be a member of Europe or not. And neither has anybody else in this country or any other part of these islands who's under the age of 55. This is something that has huge control over many parts of our lives. And I think it's right that we um, have a chance to say whether we endorse that mandate uh, on a regular basis. Um, it's also quite popular in Scotland. The latest polling and research shows that two thirds of people in Scotland want to have their say. Now, when that referendum comes around, should there be a majority uh, Conservative or a majority-led coalition government after 2015. Um, you know, I think there will be a huge campaign for people to stay in a reformed European Union. There's huge reform that's coming in Europe. It's coming under the areas that already have the euro. What the Prime Minister has said is that he wants a chance, as somebody who's outside the euro, to have that same opportunity to talk about what works for the UK, what doesn't work for the UK, and make some changes, because he doesn't think that the European Union is at its optimum. And I think most people would agree with that. There are things that we would all like to change about the European Union. 
But if he gets the changes that he wants, he said that he will also campaign to stay in the European Union. So this big scare story that the other side want you to have that says, oh, we're going to be ripped out of the European Union. Well, there's an awful lot of steps that we have to go before that's, that's ever even on the table. Uh, and I, I still think that if it's right, Blair, for the people to have a discussion, to have their say on whether they want to remain part and re-endorse the mandate of being part of a UK, then it's also right that they have the chance to discuss and they have a vote on whether they want to stay part of a European Union that also makes a lot of decisions about their rights. So I think it's very difficult for them to say it's right for people in Scotland to have a say over whether they stay part of the UK or not, but it's not right for them to have a say about whether they stay part of the European Union or not. If you trust people on one, you should trust people on the other too. Question for, for, for Ruth on Europe. Mm. What makes you think that Angela Merkel is ready to have the same reforms as you might like? And do you think she might have more weight in European discussions than any British Prime Minister, whether well, it's Mr Cameron or not? First of all, Angela Merkel um, has had a number of discussions with the Prime Minister already about this, most notably not just at Chequers, but in her country retreat in Germany, where practically no foreign leader gets invited to go. And also there are huge problems in Europe at the moment, particularly between northern European countries, uh, who have done better during the nationwide economic crisis, and a lot of southern European countries who've needed a great deal of reform to their economies, to which... Uh, Germany is doing the lion's share of bailing out in terms of responsibility for making sure that the euro hangs together. Uh, and actually, Angela Merkel needs allies in the Europe German as well. The German people are fed up with it. <coughs> the German people are fed up with it, and that's why they want people who have got a bit of fiscal rectitude, like the UK has always shown in European politics, to get involved. OK, I, I, I don't want to forget... Uh, we haven't got much time left. I don't so want to forget Jim Dyer's uh, question uh, about uh, what kind of defence and foreign policy and independent Scotland might have. Uh, and I wanted to start with, with Margot uh, on that and then yeah. come to Blair. I'm tempted to say everybody would be given a pea shooter <laughs> and a recording that said, I give up. <laughs> our defence as Scotland would, would be the defence of our, our oil rigs and the fields and the fishing grounds and the islands themselves. Now, there's a commonality of interest, I believe anyway, in all of the islands offshore Europe. You can see the other parts of the European Union almost breaking down into contiguous parts that have got something in common. The, the Baltics, the, the, there's the group in Belgium now. That's happening already because Europe got far too big to act as one. And so we've got a... a, a, a area of interest offshore Europe and I think that that could definitely show in the future for joint security but before that's established it's about power when you go to any negotiation table like that you must have some card to play we would have our sovereignty and our oil backed currency to play if we if we decided to do that but we're a few steps from that we should not be thinking about that other than in the very far distant future. But the one thing we've got to do is get shot of nuclear weapons. And I think it'll encourage folk in England to say, do we really want them? Who are we going to declare war on? Need to be somebody small like Malta. Because <laughs> the weapons aren't big enough. And we need to get the key from the United States anyway to fire them. Get shot of nuclear weapons and don't be apologetic about it. I could ask Blair to, 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 to explore those same issues, but, but thinking into that situation, if there's a yes vote, uh, and, uh, and negotiating the, the terms of, uh, of the creation of the Scottish state and its relationship with the rest of the UK, mm -hmm. those, those nukes are going to be extremely difficult to get out of Scotland, aren't they? Take a wee well, while, but we can do it. I think, I mean, I, th I think what's certainly true is that the, the, I'm sure the timing of the removal of nuclear weapons from, from Scotland would be, would be part of the negotiations that would happen. And I think that, that's, I think people would understand that that might be part of the discussion and the, and the negotiation process. Yes, Scotland is not in itself, um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't develop policy or put forward policy platforms for an independent Scotland because we, we have a membership uh, you know, volunteers and, and supporters who encompass all the political traditions in Scotland and it's for individual parties and individual uh, movements to put forward um, policy platforms. 
But the one thing is one of these areas where I think you can look forward with a great deal of confidence. There is no conceivable government in an independent Scotland that is going to support the retention of nuclear weapons in Scotland. Um, and I think it's one of these areas, and this is, this is a very important part of the debate, I think more and more what people will do as we get nearer to the vote is, is think about what's really important to them and which outcome next year is most likely to produce the outcome that you want. Now, it's interesting that the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament have urged all their supporters, all their members in Scotland to vote yes to Scottish independence on the basis of that it is the only conceivable way in which nuclear weapons will be removed from Scottish territory. And I think as people, this is a key issue, and Margot's right, it's, a, it's a, an issue that many people who support independence, including myself and, and Margot, I know, feel very passionately about. But I think it applies to other areas of life as well. As people honestly ask themselves, which vote next year is most likely to produce the kind of country, the kind of Scotland I want, that is what will move people towards the yes vote. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're, we're already uh, over time. Um, I, I wanted to, to finish off, though, by asking you, the audience, um, a, a question. Uh, and it's not whether you're going to vote yes or no. That would be too, too obvious. Um, but, but reflecting this kind of discussion with um, some of the key figures in the debate and some expert commentators on it, um, do, do you really feel that you yet have sufficient information uh, to make a decision? Those who think they do, stick their hands up. Those who think they don't. Could, you send, it, could you send your postcards to Alex Salmon, Scottish <laughs> Parliament? <laughs> okay, so, so there, is, there is a long way to go. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased that, that our panellists gave up some of their uh, time on, on a weekend uh, afternoon. Uh, to, um, I hope, give you some more of the information or at least show the areas where you will seek uh, more information. Uh, and on your behalf, I'd like to, to thank them all very much. Tom for his lecture to kick it off. Uh, Willie, uh, Ruth, Blair, Nicola uh, and Margot for their contributions. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.